You're listening to the Luminate series on the Forward Faster podcast, providing bite-sized insights for entrepreneurs in the optics, photonics, and imaging sector. Hello, and welcome to Forward Faster. This is Sujatha Ramanujan. I'm the Managing Director of Luminate. And today, we have the pleasure of the company of Chris Maloney, Managing Director of North America for VPI Photonics. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Sujatha. I'm happy to be here. So we're really excited to welcome you to Forward Faster, as well as to Rochester in the region. I know that VPI just located this operation here. You want to tell us a little bit about uh, what you've brought here and why? Um, yeah, yeah, I can do that. So let me let me first start maybe with a high level overview of VPI Photonics, who we are, mm-hmm. what, what do we provide? Um, our our mission is to empower our users to define the cutting edge, and so we do that through photonic design automation software, and also some consulting services. Um, so the way the way that we describe our software as it it's being integrated, interoperable, and industry leading. It's integrated in the sense that uh, all of our tools, we strive to have them actually work together. So if if you're working with one tool and you need to do something different, um, those two tools are integrated together. Um, It's also interoperable. We work with many third-party software Mm -hmm. vendors. So if you're doing something in the electronics world and you need to move into the optics and photonics space, You can do that. So, like, we have partnerships with um, some of the EDA companies, so electronic design automation Mm -hmm. companies like Keysight. And our software is industry leading. So, we get involved in a number of the European research projects um, sponsored, like, by the European Commission, as our our headquarters is actually in Berlin, Germany. Mm -hmm. So, we have access to that. Um, And the software tools that we provide, we offer tools at different levels of abstraction. So at the highest level, we provide internet service providers and equipment vendors tools for optical fiber network design. Um, And then we can go down a level into optical transmission systems. And this is really for the datacom telecom space, for transceiver design. Um, It can also be extended to some of the, you know, more recent applications like LIDAR technologies or health sensing. And then we move down another level to component design software. So this would be for photonic integrated circuits, so silicon photonics, fiber-based device design. And we go all the way down to the device level, so the deep physics of waveguides and fibers and how light propagates through those. So that, that's kind of in a nutshell um, who, who we are at VPI Photonics. You know, we've been in this space for for just over 25 years. Um, so at the height of the of the telecom boom, we were we were around and we've uh, pivoted along the way um, to provide tools that the industry needs. Um, so yeah, that's a you know high level overview of who we are, what we're bringing bringing to the space right now. Well, that's really exciting. So can you tell us a little bit about um, why you chose to put these operations here in, in Rochester? Yeah, so this is actually a conversation we started having probably about three years ago, just before the pandemic, mm-hmm. and we talked about you know moving our U.S. operation here, and at the time the timing wasn't really right at the time, um, but then. You know, as things changed, um, people started working from home. Um, we decided to revisit this idea as our our U.S. Uh, office was located in the greater Boston area. And so the, you know, the prices for office space are a bit more expensive than they are in Rochester. And we weren't utilizing it as much. So more of us are working from home or choosing some hybrid role of sometimes we're in the office, sometimes we're at home. Um, so the office space wasn't really being utilized, and so we decided, okay, this is a good time to, you know, revisit this idea. And so there's really three reasons why we decided to move to Rochester. And the first is the community here. So I know there's a strong optics community, you know, traditional optics, making lenses and mirrors. That's a little bit outside of the the area or the world that we're operating in. But there's a growing photonics community here. So AIM Photonics established a, a center here. So the TAP facility is here. And there's a number number of other growing photonics companies in the region. Um, there's Toptica nearby. Uh, Corning is another major one. Um, so 
So the community here is strong. Um, so we have a number of potential partnerships, you know, potential collaborators in the area. There's also the Rochester section of Optica has a, a pretty active community as well. So there's chances to network and chat with, with others in the industry. So, that, so the community is the first point. The second is the talent here. Um, so in the U.S., we're, we have a small team here, but in the future, we'll be looking to hire engineers, um, design engineers, application engineers for different projects or just for growth in general. And um, Rochester Institute of Technology has a great program that we can pull from. So they have a microelectronic engineering and microsystems engineering programs. They have a communication networks um, program, but also there's at the University of Rochester, there's the Inst Institute of Optics. So there's a strong talent pool here. And then the last, uh, the last um, reason for deciding to move is, is the cost. So just the cost of doing business. The rental space is, is a little bit cheaper. And what we've realized is, you know, the cost of doing business in general we, we can actually get a lot of savings. And that's just from lawyer fees or accountant fees are actually significantly lower here in Rochester. So as a business, we can benefit from that. But then also our, our employees can have a higher quality of life. They can get more, more bang for their buck, you know, when they're here, you know, they're able to buy a home um, <laughs> nearby, you know, uh, you know, I live, uh, five minutes now from the office and, and own a home nearby. So it's really, it's a really nice place to, to live for the employees as well. We're really excited to welcome you to our community. I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you're seeing in the industry and trends in the industry. As you had mentioned earlier, there is a rise in photonics and integrated photonics. And I wanted to ask you, what do you see? What are some of the exciting new happenings and how does that affect your business? As I mentioned before, we're pretty um, we're pretty ingrained in the you know the datacom telecom space. You know we we've been around for such a long time, so we've seen the rise of integrated photonics in that space, and it's been adopted, and that's really been the driving force for integrated photonics is datacom telecom applications, um, and you'll see it. You know, like uh, Intel has silicon photonics. I think. Um, I think it's Arista Networks just put um, lithium niobate modulators in their transceivers. Um, so, so that's really been the driving force. And what we've actually seen that with our users of the software are in that space designing integrated photonics. Um, but what we're seeing now is more applications that are leveraging the work that's been done in that space for um, new technologies. So, for example, uh, LiDAR is a big one. That's a, it's a big hot topic right now. There's a number of companies developing integrated photonics for, for LiDAR systems. Um, another one is health sensing. And what's interesting about health sensing is that a lot of the players in that space, a lot of the startups, they don't have integrated photonics experience. So one of the nice things is that they can come to us. We can help educate them along the way, get them started in the space, teach them, point them to our existing customers who maybe they can work with or train up their employees to become photonic design engineers. Um, so we do some consulting work around that, and we're seeing more of it just because there's a, a need for the education. The workforce in general isn't exactly there yet, um, and we're starting to see some of that. So, so we're helping to contribute there and doing some, some educational activities around that. So tell me a little about the workforce. What type of people um, use this kind of software? Do, is it like... PhD scientists? Is it technicians? Is it, like, how sophisticated is, mm -hmm. is the product to use? The majority of our users are either have a PhD or mm -hmm. a master's degree. Okay. And the same with most of our employees. Most of our engineers are at that level as well. Um, that's something that um, if, if you talk to people, they, many people think you need a master's or a PhD to do this. Um, we actually have a, a, an intern right now who's um, going for his, his bachelor's degree. And the reason that maybe he wouldn't have picked up the software before is maybe he just didn't have access to it at the undergrad level. Mm -hmm. But now he does. And we're actually seeing him have some success in the software. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I think there's a future for undergrads um, to get into this space, um, to do some of this design work. Um, I think it's the it's up to the universities and colleges to educate their their students uh, around this. Um, so actually, many of the universities in Europe um, are using our software. In the U.S., there's less of it. We're more commercially focused, but we're starting to see more you know universities try to integrate some of these um, software tools into their curriculum. Because I'm, I'm wondering if, like, you know, I know they teach things like how to use ZMAX or Code 5. Mm-hmm. This would be right there with that kind of suite. I mean, you obviously have your lens, like, lens design software, which is not what you do. But this would be quite complementary to that type of education. Yeah, it would. And, th- and there's a lot of overlap, too. So we, we actually have a partnership with ZMAX. Mm-hmm. Um, so so f- some of the short reach applications require some free space optics um, mm-hmm. in the transceiver. And we have a, a partnership with ZMAX to they take care of the lens design and the, uh, the ray tracing. And we take an optical beam file from ZMAX and import it into our our multi-mode fiber um, framework. So there is a lot of overlap for certain applications. But yeah, exactly. This is something that students should be learning, you know, right along with the, the ray tracing software. So I'm going to go back to that trends question. And for those of us who live in the industry, we see some of the trends that, you know, you talk about how lithium nibate modulators are like that. Lithium nibate modulators are being designed and used in the 1990s, right? Mm-hmm. So they're, but the trend of miniaturizing it, using it in different applications, is, is it's long awaited and, and and exciting to see. Is there something like that that you see now? Like you know, people are doing this. Just you wait in 10 or 20 years, it's going to be super hot, and you should watch this. Um, yeah. Well, there's one there's one application space. It's um, kind of this is kind of a general answer for you, but it's really. Um, one thing we're watching is quantum mm-hmm. technologies, and that that could mean a number of things. Yeah. That could be, you know, quantum cryptography, quantum computing, quantum sensing. Um, there's a number of, you know, research groups and startups addressing this space. I personally don't think we're there yet to you know, have a full industry. You're starting to see some companies go public um, around this space as well. But what is what's great about it is that like the work is being done, the research is being funded um, quite heavily too, actually. Um, so this is a space I'm curious to see where it goes. We we've taken a stepping stone in our software, and we provide a toolkit for quantum key distribution (QKD) um, systems, and we're starting to see some some interest there. Um, so we actually have a, a number of a number of companies looking at satellite communications, free space optical links with QKD. So there's uh, there's quite a bit of funding. There's quite a bit of activity around it. Um, is there anything that's um, commercial? Yes. How well that's adopted right now? I don't think they're they're that well adopted. But I think that's something as time goes on. Um, maybe in the next 20 years, you'll start to see some of these quantum technologies displace some of the current um, technologies. Well, that is exciting just to watch the trends and you hear quantum and, and it means so many things to so many people. So it's a good trend to watch. So do you have any advice you'd give to you know, emerging startups, so startup companies? If you notice NextCore here, we are incubator accelerator investments into pretty much early companies, anywhere from pre-seed to about A. Uh, and many of them, Luminate for one, puts 10 companies per year in the optics and photonics and imaging fields. So do you have advice to them about how to grow their business and things that to do or not to do in that startup space? Uh, Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think I can answer this a few different ways, you know, one from a technical perspective, Mm -hmm. maybe one from a business perspective. I'd say from a technical perspective, and of course, I'm kind of biased about about this answer, but <laughs> I would say budget for simulation software. Mm-hmm. And, and, that, and that might mean, you know, photonic design automation software. That might just mean computer-aided design software. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I see is you know, I'll, I'll talk to startups, show them our, our software, and, uh, and in the end, they never budgeted for it. Um, so they don't have the funds to do that. Um, so when they actually go to get something fabricated, 
you know, so many times I'll see people, they already have a thing, but they didn't do the the upfront work to simulate it and understand what are the pitfalls, what are the problems. And then they have their thing that they waited nine months for. They spent, I don't know, $100,000 on, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so getting that design right um, the first time is very important. Whether or not you can actually do that is, is another thing. Um, so from a technical perspective, and again, I'm, I'm biased on this, I'd say budget for simulation software or, or CAD software. Um, from a business perspective, what I see with a lot of the startups is, you know, they're they're so ingrained in their the problem that they're trying to solve um, that they forget about um, the networking aspect of it and just meeting people and understanding. You know, in the end, we're 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 doing business with people. You know, we're not doing business with just businesses. And so, so having those personal connections are really important. And I don't know how many times it's happened to me where, you know, I met somebody at a conference and a year later I was working on a project and I thought about that person and said, oh, I should reach out to so-and-so and, you know, maybe we can collaborate on this because I learned a little bit about what they're doing. Um, and those types of interactions, they might be random at a conference. They might be, you know, in the same building between two different companies, um, people within the companies. But those types of, of interactions, I think, are invaluable um, when you're getting started up in this space. Well, thank you so much. And those are some words of guidance, which I think our teams will appreciate and hopefully follow. So I'd like to thank you very much for joining us here at Forward Faster. And we are very excited to welcome you and VPI Photonics to our community. Great. Thanks, Sujatha. So you can find this podcast and others at nextcore.org. That's N-E-X-T-C-O-R-P-S dot org slash podcasts. <music>